Question number one, Councillor Osborne. Question number one to the leader, please. Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor, I thank Councillor Osborne for his question. Um, of course, like uh, Councillor Mrs. Tracy said last time at the Council meeting, um, I share her disappointment and I indeed I think the disappointment of many others in this chamber on both sides at the outcome of that Ofsted inspection. But what is very clear from engagement with colleagues on both sides, if I may say so, is that we have resolved, it seems, to put this behind us and start the job of putting together the trust and the faith in our children's services. And having apologized to the parents and the families of the people affected, we are now resolved in our joint effort to make sure that we get our system so right that we never let them down again. The answer gives a flavor of the stuff that we have already undertaken. They used to do little things and big things, the, the different ways of recruiting foster parents and prospective adopters so that we widen the scope uh, of potential foster parents and so that there is not a chance that some children uh, are left uh, uh, waiting for, uh, for an appropriate family uh, far too long. And of course, uh, it were an immediate instruction to ensure that young people were not housed in inappropriate accommodation. And that is the kind of thing that I know my colleague, Councillor Mrs. Tracy, and others uh, have taken a very clear interest in ensuring that it never happens again. Um, I thank the leader for that answer. Um, but I think we both note that the Ofsted report made comments about the management culture in the council. Um, so I therefore ask, going forward, uh, which is uh, the, uh, uh, another positive part of his answer, how will he address the culture in this council which too often stresses good news and too often inhibits criticism? I thank Councillor Osborne for his supplementary. I, uh, the point about cultures is that cultures are an accretion over time. And of course, the, it changes organically over time as well. And often it requires a catalyst. Perhaps this is one of those occasions when the Ofsted report will act as a catalyst to start the process of changing that culture so that it is more in tune with the needs of today. And I and my colleagues are not going to stand in the way of making sure that our internal and external culture reflects the needs of this council and what our residents demand from us. Question number two to the leader, please. I um, thank Councillor Osborne for his um, question. Um, well, I think the answer is very brief and very clear that the what other people pay their staff is not a matter for this council. But you know, as I say in my answer, that uh, it, competitive industry, uh, uh, economies deliver the kind of outcomes that he and his party would seek. And of course, this government has delivered uh, us a vibrant, growing, competitive economy. And undoubtedly, if wage levels are going to go up, somebody's going to have to afford them. And a, a growing economy delivers that outcome. Madam Mayor, well, uh, well, will the leader acknowledge uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, one glaring factual inaccuracy in his answer? Put aside the uh, fact that pro rata 13 years of Labour government had greater growth than pro rata six years of the current government, but that, park that for a moment. It's factually incorrect to say that Wandsworth Council is not responsible for the level of remuneration paid by other employers to their staff. For a start, we are supposed to ensure they pay the national living wage. So why not the London living wage? I think Councillor Osborne will find that the requirement to pay the national living wage is a requirement on all employers in the country. And I think it's a requirement imposed by the state rather than by Wandsworth Council. Wish it were that Wandsworth Council's writ are wider than its borough boundaries. But on the point of the greater growth that might have been achieved by 13 years of Labour uh, government, well, I think what we do know is that we have the greatest fall from that growth delivered by them.
Question three to the Leader of the Council. Councillor Dawson for his uh, question. I, I, there's a fairly full answer. And I think the, uh, what I hope to get out of this panel is something that I bring back to improve our delivery of our regeneration projects in Wandsworth and take to the panel some of the things that work in Wandsworth. And certainly what works in Wandsworth and one things that other colleagues on the panel have been very positive about is the way in which we have given a, a guarantee to residents on our estates that they will move once, they will have a right to return, that those who do not wish to return will be, will be allowed to stay in the temporary or the pro-term accommodation they've been granted. We have also been commended for the way in which we've engaged long and hard with local residents in, at all stages before coming to a, a view as to what, how we might procure. So, some very good outcomes there, and just one other bit to, to, to share with the Council, that um, when we launched the re procurement for the Alton uh, uh, Estate Regeneration Project, out of the 25 potential bidders that could have come to it, 19 attended, and I am told that about 12 of them already have expressed at first stage an expression of interest. Of course, they may not all come to, to, the, to, to, the, to uh, travel to the end, but it is positive to see that there is enormous interest in what we are doing and what we are delivering for our residents. Supplementary. I would thank the leader for that sort of response um, and wish him well in his endeavours. Um, as well as the impressive um, estate art that we saw during a recent visit to the uh, Peabody estate in Clapham Junction, uh, what other lessons may we be able to learn from the way they have been handling their regeneration scheme? Uh, I thank Councillor Dawson for his supplement. I mean, he, he is so right to, to, to draw a parallel with the Peabody regen at, at, uh, at Clapham Junction. So let's sort of learn some lessons from Peabody at Clapham Junction. It was not very good in terms of its fabric, and yet there was a vibrant community uh, within that estate. So what did Peabody do? Engage with that community and not break it, but keep it together as long as they could and then offer them new homes whilst their estate was rebuilt with a guaranteed right to return with in being, being kept informed all the way through the process of both demolition, rebuild, and, and, and delivery at what stage were there, to give them a choice of the types of units they could have and they might want to, and to give them also some choice of internal fittings and, and, and so on. And I think going around Peabody, I did uh, find it very, very impressive how much they had engaged with, with their former tenants uh, and, and, well, in fact, their current tenants too, because most of them moved to other Peabody properties. And I have taken, on the, taken up the opportunity to ask them if we could bring some of our residents to see how it's been done by them and how we might learn from what Peabody has delivered. I'm very pleased to say that Peabody is very, very uh, in a forthcoming in, that, uh, in, in, in accepting that offer and are happy to learn, uh, teach us the lessons that they have learned. Second supplementary, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, yes, um, thank you, Councillor Govindia. Um, the panel sounds very impressive, um, but my question is, is there any Labour representation on the panel and is there any community representation on the pa panel of the regeneration areas. In other words, community representation meaning representing the people bottom up as opposed to representing the people top down. Thank you. Well, of course, I'm not responsible for makeup of the panel. I, I'm just one of the humble members. So, so you, must, you must look to, to those who appoint as to why they have chosen who they have chosen. But no, there is a cross-section of people on the panel, and certainly what, what is important is the, the conversation they bring and the lessons they bring from their own experiences and one that sparks the debate that we have had. This panel has a very short span. It has been asked to report in time for the uh, autumn statement, so it's not got an awful lot of time. And I think that when it goes around the country, it will certainly wish to engage with, with all, all sorts of uh, stakeholders in the estate regeneration story. 
Question four of the leader. I, I thank Councillor Grimston for his um, question. Um, as it says, you know, the, the Ofsted regime has changed since 2012. It's become tougher in many ways, and we are not the only ones to have uh, uh, come a cropper, as, as it might, the expression might be. So 27% of the Ofsted reports are, 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 are inadequate, and 51 judged to, to be requiring improvement. Of course, in 2012, we were judged good, and not so now. What's happened? Their regimes changed several times. We have had some difficulties in, 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 in retaining, recruiting uh, staff at the right level in this critical area. And of course, um, with, with that kind of difficulty, that uh, it's, it's obvious that some of our, our staff have not uh, learned the lessons of, of keeping up with changing demands of the Ofsted regime. But what I'd like to say to colleagues is that, you know, it's time for us to step back and say that it is not all broken and busted in children's services. I mean, there is an awful lot of good in children's services, and not only just in children's services, but across the council. Our education bit of the children's services has the most spectacular results, in, uh, and, and there are some still embargoed, but they are all coming through to say that we have we are the third best local authority in London for in terms of schools performing exceptionally well for our residents. Early, earlier today, we found that um, our rate in teenage pregnancy has fallen, and we are now, we have the greatest fall of any top tier authority in England and Wales. So there is a lot of good being done by our staff and, our, uh, and the children's services and our partners too. I mean, they are part of this, this story. So, what I might plead to colleagues on both sides is let us learn from what has gone wrong and let's move on to put it right and let us not at the same time think that we are uh, we have a children's department which is so busted that it is not uh, redeemable it is exceptionally good in many places and of course it needs support and nurture in many others and, and let's do the latter and celebrate the former Supplementary response. I would, uh, first question I say to the leader is, does he recognise there's a bit of a danger of overstressing the difference in the Ofsted regime? For example, he'll be well aware that in 2012, 3% of local authorities nationally were regarded as what is now called outstanding. That figure is now 0%, but not that big a difference, actually. There certainly has been a reduction in the number of councils uh, graded as good. But what is not misleading is to point out that, roughly speaking, we were about in the 23rd percentile of local authorities in 2012, so if we're in the middle of the good range. We are now, roughly speaking, in the 86th percentile. If is we're there in a question? The middle, yeah, this is exactly the question, Mr. Mayor, but it's important to put it out here. We've moved from being the 23rd percentile in the top quarter in the country to the 86th percentile well into the bottom quarter in the country. And furthermore... Yeah, and that is the question. Firstly, is, is there not a danger that by continuing to blame, as I heard, Ofsted and the members of staff and not recognising our role in members? Yeah, yeah, sure, but I can't answer your question while continuing to ask my own question, if I might say, Mr. Mayor. So that, but the second point I make is, isn't the whole point uh, about this, that last statement, we have no reason or evidence to think that is similar issues affect other parts of the council. We have no reason to think these issues were facing children's services. And is it not time that we actually recognise that this could be an issue which is deeper than a single part of a single service, good as many of our services undoubtedly are? I, I have some serious difficulties with Councillor Grimston's question because in my relatively long answer, I did not dwell an awful lot on the changing regime at, in Ofsted. For him to then suggest that I am misleading the council by dwelling a lot on it, I think he's misleading us. I don't have the flair for this kind of statistical slicing of the mustard seed that he has been doing. What I do know is what was wrong needs putting right and we are getting on with the job of putting right. He does have a view that this council has, would benefit enormously from changing the way it functions. 
Unfortunately, not many of, your, many of the, my colleagues on this side share wholeheartedly that view. But what we do share is that what has gone wrong needs putting right. And if people want to come on board in doing that, you are all welcome. Second supplementary. Um, is there any other work going, across, going on across council departments um, to make sure, for example, that the KPIs that we use are appropriate? I thank Councillor Caddy for her question. I, she's absolutely right to, to, to put her finger on the KPIs. Uh, I, for a moment, I'd like to sort of just remind the Council that KPIs are born out of a regime where we were measuring ourselves against other local authorities, and so they had a kind of relative merit and people understood them very well. And now that we are not in that situation, we have run with, the main, by and large, those same KPIs, but for a different purpose. And I think, I think that in course of time, we have uh, lost the, uh, the, the, the changed purpose of the KPIs and perhaps also lost the art of cross-examining them as deeply as we should do. But what has happened as a result of Ofsted uh, is, is a very clear uh, determination to look at KPIs across all the parts of the Council and to see whether they are, A, necessary, appropriate, are they being measured in the right way, are they teaching us the lessons we need to learn, are we asking the questions we need to ask, are there trends that we are not fa failing to see, are, 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 are there, is there another bit of the statistic that is not revealed in the KPI and should we in fact be looking more closely at things that are just uh, uh, red or just ember or just green to, to ensure that the direction of travel is robust and clear. So there will be changes in the KPIs, there will be changes in the way they are looked at, and there will be changes in, in the way which colleagues uh, will, will uh, cross-examine those KPIs and the officers who report on them. So all those, hopefully, together, will give us an early warning system that we re desperately need. Question five to the leader. I think, um, Councillor, Carpenter for his question. Uh, as the answer says, the, the, the figures that he talks about, about affordable housing, are actually not, in a sense, as he'd like, they're not a, a number of houses we need to de meet the demand that he has identified. It is about what can be delivered within the resources that are available. And then, of course, the whole regime on the, in the planning side, that is that these numbers are subject to viability assessment as to whether a particular scheme is viable in delivering the development and in, develop, in delivering the development, what scope is there to meet the affordable housing target for that, uh, for that development. But there are in the, embedded in the figures some, some, some very impressive uh, delivery figures. Certainly in 1718, we should be able to get 1,800 new homes, uh, provided the, the development base is, is as is. I think one of the interesting things I spotted in um, this evening's uh, papers is that um, uh, Labour Party's mayoral candidate has borrowed from Ken Livingston the 50% target for affordable homes. It's just worth reminding ourselves that, of course, he never delivered 50% affordable homes in his eight years tenure as mayor of London. So I don't know why we should be so gullible as to accept that a future mayor who would be able to deliver 50% affordable targets. He also talks about a kind of truly affordable home without defining it. And the other thing I sort of looked for was whether there was a precise figure of how many homes, affordable homes or otherwise, uh, were, were, were to be delivered. And I, the figure I couldn't find, unless I'm sort of short-sighted about it, and I suspect it's because it's, it's a manifesto which is all things to all men and not very much substance otherwise. Supplementary. supplementary. Um, I thank the leader for his comprehensive uh, answer. Uh, if I do my sums right, uh, we are actually over the five-year period he refers to delivering something like 517 affordable houses per annum, which is 81% of the target rather than the 46% uh, the, uh, which we've put in our plan. Should we not uh, revise our figures upwards to reflect our actual achievements, perhaps even further upwards to uh, reflect some actual aspirations for change? 
it's, it's uh, grateful to Council Carpenter for drawing attention to delivering above target. Um, Line Elm's a classic example, isn't it? We started with a very clear, very easy to understand target that every site had to deliver 15% affordable homes plus a mass massive contribution to the delivery of Northern Line. We have delivered 15% on every site, and in the more recent uh, planning permissions, we have inched, in fact, scale further than 15%. We are now touching 25 and nearly 30%, in, 29% in one case that currently is being negotiated. So we are doing far, far better than our original target, but what I do feel is right to say is that had we set a very high, unattainable, and unrealistic target, it is quite likely that the development may not have in fact happened. So the moral of the story is, you know, a bit like an auction. Start low and then let it rise rather than start high and kill the, kill the interest. Supplementary. Um, does the leader agree with me that um, Council Carpenter is actually being rather negative and that officers at the, at the council are constantly thinking of ways to put young people or any residents on the housing ladder um, for example, through innovative ideas like pocket homes or through the regular um, events where people can come and learn about ways to, to um, get on the housing ladder. I thank Councillor uh, McDermott for her question. I think um, uh, I suppose it would be fair for Councillor Osborne to say that it is his job to be negative because I think we're often reminded by the opposition that it's their job to oppose. So I suppose part of the opposition is to be negative. But you're right to draw your, uh, our attention to the fact that whilst the housing challenge is, a, is an acute one, uh, there are still ways in which we can open up opportunities of home ownership and a decent home rented or otherwise for, for people by looking at Pocket as an example, and we have possibly got the largest uh, uh, development of pocket homes anywhere at the moment with planning permission in London. But more than that, I think I know the Councillor Ellis has looked at ways in which uh, sort of uh, um, you know, more, more temporary accommodation, which doesn't look temporary, uh, sort of using porter cabin type of structures to provide homes on derelict, derelict land for the time being, but also to, to, to look at opportunities of uh, wrinkling out even more space on our estates like Councillor Martin Johnson had pioneered many years ago in the Hidden Homes Programme. So we are looking everywhere possible to deliver more opportunities for people to both own and be housed. That is actually the end of time for questions to the leader.